President Obama's executive actions limiting gun rights will restrict our law-abiding citizens, not the criminals or the terrorists who target them. We don't beat the bad guys by taking away our guns. We beat the bad guys by using our guns. But you know what the president will be doing in the next week is an executive order. The next president on the very first day could wipe it away. The political divide over gun control was once again on display this week. President Obama took the lead on the issue. He was emotional as he met with families who lost children to gun violence. He took action by tightening gun regulations through executive executive orders. Donald Trump made clear that the 2016 election could decide if those tightened regulations will stay in place. I will get rid of gun-free zones on schools and you have to. And on military bases, my first day, it gets signed, okay? My first day. There's no more gun-free zone. A gun-free zone on a military base with some of the best soldiers we have sitting there, relaxing, watching television. No gun. Guy walks in, kills all of them, okay? That ends immediately. I'm joined by Democratic political analyst Mara Dolan and Republican analyst Jennifer Braceres, editor of NewBostonPost.com. Okay, ladies, who won the gun argument? This just purely from a, a, a political analysis. Who won this week? Was it Obama? Was it uh, uh, Trump? I think the Republicans win politically on this, and here's why. The gun lobby, whether you're for them or against them, is one of the strongest lobbies in the country. But it's not just the lobby, it's the voters. And you can take any other single-issue voter, whether it's pro-choice activists, pro-life activists, um, any other issue, right? Gun pro-gun voters vote more than any so other single issue voters. So you're saying that even voters. though that the majority of Americans are for more gun controls or gun safety, they don't vote as often as the well, single actually, voters. Well, actually, the polls show that most Americans oppose Obama acting through executive orders on this, on this issue. On this issue, but they're not against gun safety steps. Not necessarily, but they'd like to see the president go through the democratic legislative process that our Constitution requires. Like all the other Republican and Democratic presidents did before him with thousands of... Well, they should. <laughs> they certainly should. What do you think, Mara? Yeah, politically, the Democrats won this week. President Obama has drawn a line in the sand and said that we should not support candidates who do not support sensible gun regulations. We all know what happens 90, when he draws lines of the sand. 90%, 90%. A little serious, a little serious point there. <laughs> I, no, listen to this point. 85% of gun owners support gun laws that promote right, the public here's safety. The challenge, Mara. And they don't like the congressional GOP circumventing Can the will Democrats of the people. Can Democrats be single issue voters? I know Republicans can be single issue voters, but Democrats have never really been able to show that unity, have they? Sure they have. And on something as important as things. this, where you have 11,000 Americans killed every year in gun homicides, a mass shooting every single day, no other country in the world has that. It's because of our gun laws. People want reform and they want it now. The Democrats won this week. Not one of these shootings, recent shootings in the past year, would have been stopped by anything he's proposed. I don't know. You know, but that's sort of the, the argument always about individual crimes. But, mm. um, you know, most guns that are on the streets uh, that are happening in Chicago, happening in Boston, mm -hmm. police officer shot today in Boston and Philadelphia, guns. but th they were at one time owned legally, were they not? I don't know the answer to that. But it, it would, it, how are guns coming into the country? I mean, I think that the gun issue itself. How are drugs coming into the country? Well, they were never legal. There's gun trafficking and I mean, domestic Right, but you're not, you're not killing somebody with a Valium prescription. You're killing somebody no, with a gun that was once legally will traffic owned. traffic in guns regardless of what the law-abiding citizens do and regardless of what the laws are. We should make it as difficult as possible. <laughs> so um, <laughs> the, we, we, I think that everyone's trying to do that for sure. So let's talk a little bit about... Uh, the wall that is dividing the Republican candidates. This week, Jeb Bush scoffed at Donald Trump's vow to wall off Mexico, and Trump answered last night in a speech to uh, a rally in Vermont. So I just think it's time for us to have grown-up solutions for complex problems rather than appealing to people that you know it's not going to happen. I mean, the idea that Donald Trump would say, we're going to build a wall, and Mexico's going to pay for it. But just, I'll just let, I'm not going to say anything more about it. I'll let you ponder that for a moment and think if that is realistic. We are going to build a wall. Don't worry about it. And who's going to pay for the wall? 
Who's going to pay for the wall? Who's going to pay for the wall? I've never done that Larry, before. He's, he, uh, um, Jeb Bush has kind of taken the Al Gore road here. The you know, remember when he used to lecture us about things that were going to change when he was president? Right. Is that a good route for Bush for Jeb to go by? I mean, earlier he was going to bully the bully and shut mm -hmm. him down. I don't know that Jeb has any good route at this point. Yeah. I really don't, to be honest with you. I think the best thing that can happen to the Republican Party would be for Jeb Bush to get out of the race and throw the power of the Bush family and the establishment around somebody else. Well, do you think that will happen? I mean, this isn't the first time that there's been a big field in a, in a campaign. It doesn't look like Jeb's got it to go over the finish line. No, and wouldn't you think he would have figured that out by now? And if he hasn't figured it out by now, I don't know what it's going to take. So I think it's I think Jeb was right, but I don't think he's going to do it. Does anybody wonder within the in, in the Trump world um, exactly how these things are going to get done? I mean, I'm fascinated by he continues to make remarks mm -hmm. and has slogans, but, you know, just saying that Mexico will pay for this is not a plan. Right, and what's interesting is, you know, he comes out on stage in Lowell uh, earlier this week, and his theme song is Twisted Sister, We're Not Gonna Take It, right? And I think that that really um, epitomizes his campaign and why people like him every single time he says something more outrageous. All right, let's climb into the Wayback Machine and go back to 1980 when Republicans George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan debated immigration, and the tone and substance were very different than today. As we have kind of made illegal, sometimes a labor that I'd like to see legal, we're doing two things. We're creating a whole society of really honorable, decent, family-loving people that are in violation of the law, and secondly, we're exacerbating relations with Mexico. These are good people, strong people. Part of my family is a Mexican. Rather than making them or talking about putting up a fence, why don't we work out some recognition of our mutual problems, make it possible for them to come here legally with a work permit, and then while they're working and earning here, they pay taxes here. And when they go, want to go back, they can go back and they can cross and open the border both ways by understanding their problems. This is the only safety valve right now they have with that unemployment that probably keeps the lid from blowing off down there. Mara, who are those progressive Democrats? Elder statesmen. They have <laughs> compassion, empathy, insight. I know, they're wonderful. The word compassion, I was struck when I saw this uh, earlier today, mm -hmm. Jennifer. They said compassion. I mean, it's not a word you hear a lot when the Republican frontrunners are talking about immigration. Well, you hear it when Marco Rubio is talking. True, and true. I think what's interesting is the media likes to put everything in terms of you're either for open borders or you're for amnesty. And the reality is there's a lot of nuance among the Republican field on this issue. And Marco Rubio is really the only one who can speak to both sides of that debate because he is compassionate. And he says time and time again, everyone in my family is an immigrant. All of my neighbors are immigrants. All of my wife's family are immigrants. I get this. And yet, he is for securing the border, and he is for doing a lot of the things that the Republicans want to see done, but he's for doing it in a compassionate way. Laura, it almost sounded to me, too, like they were saying we should be investing in Mexico. If we make Mexico a better place, people won't come here. Recognizing uh, that we're neighbors? Yeah, yes, I mean, it's just, it just shocking to me. I mean, I get yeah. goosebumps just thinking too. about this. I did this. the same thing. So it's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. Maybe we can look at that as a plan going yes. forward. Okay. Well, the nightmare 2016 outcome for Democrats is vividly portrayed on the latest cover of Time magazine. The cover is imaginary at this point, but pro-democratic unions like the SEIU are starting to question if Trump could steal votes from their ranks. Unions. Yeah, well. For well, Trump. Yeah, no. I'm, they need maybe an education campaign, but most union members know that Donald Trump is not in favor of raising wages, job stability, retirement well, I look security. At that crowd. He wants to lower raises. He said America will only stay competitive if we depress wages. But there's a reason that Bernie Sanders has said he wants to go after some of the Trump voters. They both appeal to the disaffected in some sense. And union members, a lot of them are for Trump, and not just union members. A lot of African Americans are for Trump. There are a lot of people who are independents or Democratic voters who will cross party lines to vote for Donald Trump if he is the nominee. Whether you like that or not, that is the case. I look at those crowds for Trump, and those people look like they are, are people who might have uh, a membership card to a union. I think that's what the Trump people want you to think. 
but I don't. Are they having them change when they come in? Well, no, you can't judge, <laughs> you know? you can't judge a person by what their no, clothes are. No, you can't. Are. But when you look at a group of people, they're not rich people. people. Union members are not rich people. Trump supporters are not rich people. So I wouldn't know. That's what look, the Trump people want people to think that unions are going for Trump, but they're not. I was telling this story right before we we went on camera. I have a friend of mine, an African American fellow who gets his hair cut in an African American barber shop has for over 10 years. His barbers are all for Trump, and they both voted, they, both of the barbers voted for Barack Obama twice. These are not your typical Republican voters. All right, I promised you guys that uh, you would get to weigh in on my interview with Lena Dunham. First, here's how she inter introduced herself earlier today in New Hampshire. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And I can't say how amazing, I mean, look at this group of girls. This is the future right in front of us. and. It's an amazing thing. I spend a lot of time on the set of a television show in a kind of strange, not real world. And so to get to come out and actually meet women in states like New Hampshire, see your courage and your strength and your style, it's an honor for me and I'm learning so much. So thank you so much for hosting me and for hosting my best friend, Abby, who I met this morning. <laughs> it, so Jennifer, I, I know you watched the earlier part um, of my interview yeah. with her. Is there anything you can really disagree with, not just about, you know, her support for Hillary and being a Democrat, right. but she said some things about young people getting involved. Do you agree? Sure, of course. I hope young people should vote. They should pay more attention to the news. They should research the candidates. What's a question you would ask? Good. What's a question you would have asked Lena Dunham? I wouldn't have asked her anything because, frankly, I don't think she's very interesting or that her views are that relevant. But that's just me. But she's relevant to the millennials, which would be crucial to, you know, really finding a, right. a constituency. Well, I think what's interesting about her um, from a political perspective for the Clinton campaign is that Clinton has been progressively losing the support of women who look like Hillary Clinton, right? Middle-aged, married, white women. And so what she really needs to do to make up that gap is to get more millennial voters um, and Lena Dunham is, I think, Hillary Clinton what is hoping think, can help her do that. Her? As a middle-aged white woman, <laughs> I didn't have the answer I've that heard question. that about you. I thought, I thought that about you, too. I thought, uh, I thought what Lena Dunham did was really striking. First of all, she is a millennial. Uh, Bernie Sanders has been doing better than Hillary Clinton among millennials. But she's also an unabashed Hillary Clinton supporter. She's there in are love a lot with of Hillary Clinton. And they tend to be shy about it. So good for Lena Dunham. All right, Dunham thanks to both shy. of you. Next, I'll give you a sneak preview of next week's show. So stand by. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.